It's a phrase and screen seared into the memories of anyone who visited an arcade in the late 80s and 90s. An arcade staple that's just as recognizable as Street Fighter 2, NBA Jam, or Pac-Man. Winners don't use drugs. Though the screen came in various different colors and styles, its overall format remained consistent and immediately identifiable. The FBI seal, the slogan winners don't use drugs, and of course, the name William S. Sessions, Director, FBI. So how did this screen end up on so many different arcade games across multiple competing companies, both foreign and domestic? Today, we're going to take a look at how the FBI and William S. Sessions, the first FBI director in history to be fired, used the American Amusement Machine Association to get onto arcade screens all over the United States. This is the story of the winners don't use drug screen. On January 10, 1989, at the FBI headquarters in Washington, FBI Director William S. Sessions stood in front of three arcade machines, Double Dragon 2, Team Quarterback, and Ninja Gaiden. Flanked by members of the FBI and the American Amusement Machine Association, also known as the AAMA, a smiling Sessions revealed the first three games that would carry the FBI's Winners Don't Use Drugs screen. In a somewhat surreal scene, America's war on drugs had reached the arcade. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. By the late 1980s, the United States' war on drugs and the hysteria that accompanied it had been in full swing for nearly two decades. What should you do when someone offers you drugs? Stop! As part of the FBI's ongoing efforts in this war, the FBI introduced a new drug awareness program in August of 1987. A few months later, this program gained a powerful and enthusiastic supporter in the form of William S. Sessions, who was sworn in as the new director of the FBI in November of 1987. Throughout the next year and a half, Sessions used the program to increase the FBI's drug prevention efforts. In April of 1988, Sessions implemented his own initiative, the Drug Reduction Demand Program. Later that year, as part of his new initiative, FBI Director William S. Sessions asked the head of the FBI's Office of Public Affairs, Bob Davenport, to put together a drug prevention campaign aimed at reaching American children. Sessions wanted a campaign that was tied into activities that kids enjoyed doing. This was something that Davenport's Office of Public Affairs had failed to accomplish. Luckily for Davenport, a meeting with an old friend was about to drop a solution in his dinner plate. Bob Fay was a former FBI agent who had recently become the executive vice president of the American Amusement Machine Association, a trade organization that represents the arcade and coin-op industry. Bob Fay also just happened to be an old friend of Bob Davenport's. One evening, Fay and Davenport met up for dinner in Washington, and it's at this dinner that the road their careers were on came to an intersection. We were talking about my new career and how we had this emphasis on drug awareness. And I said, hey, I might be able to help you out. I've got thousands of video games that we could put a message on. Frankly, we hadn't even thought about that until Bob Fay came to us and said, look, I think I can help you out. According to an interview with Bob Davenport, things moved rather quickly after their dinner. Bob Fay made a few trips out to Washington to meet with the FBI in order to iron out their requirements. There were only four people in total that worked on the project and Sessions' only direction to the team was for the message to be simple and recognizable. We needed something that was going to be recognizable with the seal there. Then we wanted to have the short message there, something that would be read and digested by the young people, because the video game players were mainly teenagers, probably 12 to 21 or 22 years old. As for who came up with the Winners Don't Use Drugs slogan itself, well, no one really remembers. Faye thinks that Davenport came up with the slogan, but Davenport thinks it was someone else that said it when the team was throwing ideas around. In terms of the message that the FBI was trying to get across, it was about as perfect a slogan as anyone could have come up with. As Bob Fay put it, we wanted to get it to something that was short, something that you could say winners not only applied to game playing, but also, if you want to be a winner in life, you can't use drugs. As its executive vice president, Bob Fay was able to get AAMA members like Capcom, Nintendo, Sega, Konami, and many others to agree to show the message. 
At the time of the FBI's press conference in January of 1989, 17 of the AAMA's 20 game manufacturers had already agreed to join the Winners Don't Use Drug campaign. By the end of January, a total of 10,000 cabinets had already been programmed to display the Winners Don't Use Drug screen, and Faye expected 100,000 machines to bear the message by the end of the year. The FBI wanted to make sure that their message could be displayed without players having to actually spend any money to see it, and they also wanted the message to be repeated. This is why the Winners Don't Use Drug screen was programmed to be displayed during a game's attract mode, which is the game demo that plays on an arcade screen when it isn't in use. The variety of Winners Don't Use Drug screen is due to it being up to the arcade game's developer to program the message into their game's attract mode. While there were guidelines from the FBI that arcade manufacturers had to follow, there was no set version of the screen that all participating manufacturers had to use. Programming this screen wasn't just a favor from arcade manufacturers to the FBI. The arcade industry itself also benefited in two ways. For one, the Winners Don't Use Drug screen helped with combating piracy, as the lack of a Winners Don't Use Drug screen in games from participating manufacturers often meant that that machine was a counterfeit. Second, the program provided some positive publicity to the arcade game industry, including to local arcade owners. It wasn't unusual for trade publications such as Replay and the game manufacturers themselves to tout their involvement in the FBI's campaign as a good deed and proof that they were a responsible industry. At the time, arcades were often labeled as a negative influence on children. As a result, many parents were concerned about the impact the local arcade may have on their kids. Officials say they are responding to complaints from parents that children have skipped school or stolen money to play the games and made a nuisance of themselves. Senior citizens have rights. They have rights to go into the laundromat and wash the, the laundry in peace. They don't have to go buy two or three machines. Our kids congregating and passing fast remarks as they walk in and terrorizing them in some instances as they go in. I'm a probation officer working with street gangs and I've noticed that video uh, arcades are places where gang members hang out and intimidate other kids. The FBI's endorsement of the arcade industry as an anti-drug partner went a long way to quell some parents' fears. Now that may sound silly or ridiculous now, but keep in mind that the war on drugs and everything that came along with it was such a big deal at the time that there were literally arcades that made being anti-drug a part of their marketing, such as the Just Say No Arcade in Louisville, Kentucky. Eventually, all 20 of AAMA's manufacturers agreed to join the campaign. Now, it's worth noting that there are some articles from the last decade that state that a law was passed that required all imported machines to carry the Winners Don't Use Drugs slogan. While this law or regulation may very well exist, I personally wasn't able to find any proof of it. The Winners Don't Use Drugs slogan was programmed into arcade machines until the year 2000, though you may have noticed that games from the mid-90s onward don't usually include Session's name and instead simply say FBI Director or sometimes just Winners Don't Use Drugs. William S. Session's name was dropped from the Winners Don't Use Drugs screen sometime in 1993, following his removal from office by President Clinton after, among other things, Sessions was accused of failing to pay taxes related to his use of an FBI limo, using the FBI's plane to visit his family, and of using government funds to pay for a security fence at his home. As he left this morning for the office, FBI Director William Sessions again insisted he would not resign. And I will not give up on the Bureau. But late this afternoon, the White House gave up on him. I called Director Sessions a few moments ago and informed him that I was dismissing him effective immediately. The FBI's Winners Don't Use Drug screen inspired other lesser-known video game PSAs, such as the Environmental Protection Agency's Recycle It, Don't Trash It campaign, as well as several anti-drinking and driving messages. But none of these PSAs reached the notoriety of the FBI's original slogan. So did the Winners Don't Use Drugs Arcade PSA actually keep anyone from using drugs? Who knows? Even Faye and Davenport admit that something like that is impossible to judge, but they feel that they were extremely effective in achieving their goal of raising awareness among young arcade goers. These days, the Winners Don't Use Drugs screen is more a part of gaming history than an anti-drug measure. It's still a common sight in retro arcades and barcades all over the world. A screen filled with nostalgia that with just a glance has the power to transport us back to the 90s. Nostalgia itself can be like a powerful drug, warping our memories and feelings about the past. How ironic that the Winners Don't Use Drugs screen is now itself a part of that drug. 
A big thank you goes out to Historic Nerd and Friday Night Arcade for providing the voices of Bob Davenport and Bob Fay. Both of these guys have great retro gaming centric channels and I'll leave a link to them in the description and pinned comment down below. I'd like to thank Ethan from The History of How We Play for providing a few of the trade magazines that I had trouble tracking down myself while researching this video. Ethan's The History of How We Play is a great gaming history site and I'll leave a link to it in the description and pinned comment down below. I'd also like to thank all of my Patreon supporters. Your support is truly appreciated. To keep up on what's happening with the channel, please follow me on Twitter at Vessels Gaming. If you'd like to support the channel monetarily, you can do so at Patreon at patreon.com forward slash wrestling with gaming. But most of all, thank you for watching.